So the title of the first talk, I forgot to actually tell you the title of the first talk, is Have They Been Examined? And by that I mean, has their head been examined? The title of the second talk is straight from, also straight from the ordinal, Give Him Your Power. So the colic for the third Sunday of Advent begins and asks you, let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. 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 So interesting. I love that, that collect because whenever I hear the term stir up your power, it basically means, you know, Lord, if you need to, get a little angry. You know? We're so worried about God being angry. Because our experiences with anger are so negative. But God's anger can actually be a good thing. And his power can be a good thing. One of my favorite stories comes from a friend who worked customer service with Dell Computers. He's used to getting angry calls, but this one was especially toxic. The person had accused him personally, by name, of selling him a computer that did not work. Now, without missing a beat, he assured the man that he would do anything in his power to make him a satisfied customer. His first question is always the simplest and the most poignant. Is it plugged in? Of course it is, the man replied. Do you think I'm an idiot, relying on his training at that moment to not answer truthfully? He stated, no, sir, but check anyway. Well, I can assure you that this is not the problem, as I am an expert in computers. Oh, the line clicked, dial tone. The man had never plugged it in. <clears throat> There's a moment in the ordination of a deacon and a priest where the bishop puts his or her hands on the ordinand and literally calls on God to give them power. Oh God, most merciful Father, this is on page 545. Oh God, most merciful Father, we praise you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who took on himself the form of a servant and humbled himself, becoming obedient even to death on the cross. We praise you that you have highly exalted him and made him Lord of all, that through him we know that whoever would be great must be servant of all. We praise you for the many ministries in your church and for calling this, your servant, the order of deacons. And here the bishop lays their hands on the ordinary and prays. Therefore, Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, give your Holy Spirit to, insert your name if you desire, fill him with your grace and power and make him a deacon in your church. And for some of you six months from now, for some of you in a week or so, that is make him a priest in your church. <coughs> Now this begs for me a very important question, and I remember this question being posed to me by my spiritual director just before my ordination to the diaconate, because he took me through the ordinal and said, what power? I mean, think for a moment, what is the actual power that an ordained person receives? Where does the power of a deacon or priest come from? Does it come from the church? Does it come from the bishop? Does it come from their sense of call? Your answer to that question will be greatly influenced by your experiences and understandings of power and authority. As a good Episcopalian in the Anglican tradition, I offer the following option that is rooted in Scripture. But first it begins by asking another question. The power to do what? For the priest, it's obvious. We call them the ABCs, as Chester always points out to me. A for absolve, 
B for bless, C for consecrate. The priest may declare the forgiveness of sins, absolution, may bless items and people, and consecrate the elements in the Eucharistic celebration. For the deacon, it seems a bit more complicated. The deacon cannot do any of those things. Now, under moments of extreme need and duress, under the authority of their priest, they may perform extreme unction. But other than that, their power seems less palpable and defined until you get deeper. The power of the deacon is tied to the servanthood of Christ. So one of the best examples of this is a reading that we participated in just, if you can believe it, maybe just a month and a half ago. John 13, 1 through 16. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his power had his, his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. Moving forward, after he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? To you, not for you. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I set for you an example that you should do as I have done. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. So on this last night with his disciples, before he would endure unfathomable cruelty and his own death, Jesus left two things with his disciples that they were to carry on after his death. He gave them the sacrament of his body and blood so that they would always be fed and always remember how his sacrifice on the cross formed the new covenant between God and humanity. And he gave them the example of servanthood. He washed their feet, even the, foot, even the feet of the one who would betray him. He wanted them to understand that the life of a servant is not to seek to be elevated but to elevate others. Okay, let's pause there for a second. One of the images that I gave about three Monday Thursdays ago was I was in the sacristy where we keep all the silver and everything like that, the preparation sacristy, and I washed my hands, and then I went looking for paper towels, and I said, what the heck are the paper towels? And I thought to myself, the altar guild is really good about this kind of stuff. There's no way they would not have a thing to wash your hands and then not dry them. That's just, that's not them. And then I thought, wait a minute. Because, see, there's these, all these drawers and cabinets, and you have to look underneath like this in order to see that the paper towels are right there. <laughs> right? Because I'm six foot tall and not five foot two like the rest of the altar guild, I didn't see it. When we wash the feet of someone, we can only look in two places, at their feet or at their face. If you look at their feet, there's no confusing feet with anything else. You are looking at a human being's feet that you are touching, and you are committing the act of a servant. If you are looking up, you have now elevated this person in status above you. And you have said to their face, I am your servant. <clears throat> There's no mistaking anything when you're doing this act. And so it's with that in mind that I want us to think about what does it mean to be a member of the clergy. Too many clergy fall into the trap of seeing their ministry as a job for a career, as if they're climbing the corporate ladder. 
As they climb the ladder, perks, benefits, and comforts increase. Some cease visiting the sick and the dying as their focus becomes fundraising and committee work. Not every rector of a large parish or dean of a cathedral is like this, but there is always the temptation in the beginning of one's ministry to fall into that trap, to become the servant who says, that task is beneath me. Remember though, nothing was beneath Jesus Christ. Let me expound on that for a minute. I'm not saying that the clergy who are supposed to be paid shouldn't get paid. That's not what I'm saying. Because the priest who receives a salary is not being paid to work. They're being paid by the congregation so they do not have to go out and seek employment. That's, you see the difference there? So if it's kind of like the police officer that you see having an ice cream cone, this is very good from the TV show, where somebody walks in and says, you know, you're on break right now, but I pay your salary. There are people who will do that to clergy and say, you know, I, my generosity pays your salary. Thank you. I really appreciate it. What do you want, I mean, what do you want me to say in response to that? But this is the Episcopal Church. We're a rich denomination. So what tends to happen is where do clergy want to go? If you're a priest, where do you want to serve? You want to go to a poor church? You want to go to a rich church? Don't be ashamed. <laughs> you want to go to a rich church, right? Nothing wrong with the wealthy parish, but you want to go there. And then there's all kinds of perks and things that can happen along the way. But we have to be careful that the higher we come in our authority and power, that we forget that we are servants. <clears throat> One of the tests I give people whenever they come to work for me is I ask them, what is the name of the person who cleans your house or office? Do you know them on a first name basis? That's important to me because too often the people who are in the service industry are hidden. They're in the back room. We don't care who they are. We don't care what they do. Sometimes we can call them riffraff. <laughs> in the church, we cannot do that. The gentleman who cleans our church is named Luis Asensio. And we are keeping him in prayer because just about two weeks ago, he lost his wife suddenly. And the moment I heard that, myself and somebody else went over while he was cleaning to comfort him. That, you see, that's the difference. Power comes from servanthood. And when the bishop places his hands upon you and asks God to give God's power to you, it's a deep theological statement of our dependence on God. We have no power on our own. We can do nothing on our own. All the deacon and priest may do is reflect and reveal the power of God as we are conduits of his grace and mercy. I have never forgiven anyone of their sins. I have never made communion. I have never blessed anything it is the power of God working within me that has done those things. And thank goodness, because what if I'm not feeling well that day? What if I'm feeling particularly sinful that day because I'm a sinner? That person is not going to get the full force of God's power if it has to depend on me. By the way, if you want to get theological, and you know that I like to usually do. Whenever we see a member of the clergy that we don't like, and we say, I don't want that person to do anything for me, we have fallen into the heresy of Donatism. Because it's the belief that the power that God gives is dependent upon the person. And so it doesn't matter if there's a priest that you don't like or a bishop that you don't like. If they consecrate communion through the power of God, 
It's not tainted because they touched it. Because thankfully, as Martin Luther said, if God can speak through the voice of an ass, then there's hope for the rest of us. Now this can be frustrating, this idea of being a conduit. Because we wish we had the power to solve every problem, as Deacon Chester reminded us. To cure every sick person, save every person from poverty. But the power of a deacon is not to solve problems. <coughs> that is a very Western idea. That's a very to-do list idea. It is to bring those problems to the attention of the church so that the full authority and power of the body of Christ may be brought to bear on the needs of the people. Now a good way to remember this is to think about how Jesus gave his power to his apostles after his resurrection. So remember, after the resurrection, Jesus comes before the eleven, because somebody's missing, Thomas, and he says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Jesus never meant for his ministry to end after his death. It was to continue in the ministry of the church. So think of what it means to receive the breath of God. When God first created Adam, he breathed life into him from his own breath, the ruach, for those of you who would like a bagel right now. Adam did not come to this breath on his own. Neither do we. Our breath comes from and returns to God. When the prophet Ezekiel is brought to the valley of the dry bones and sees them, he puts them back together by tendon and muscle, but without life. God does that because he prophesies to the bones. But they're not alive. They're still dead. It's when God says, prophesy to the breath, that they begin to take on life. And I love that we read that reading at the Great Vigil. God breathes the Holy Spirit upon the ordained. And we must be reminded each day of ministry that the breath is not ours. The power is not ours. But power also requires caution and care. Because any power can be misused and abused. And we have far too many examples of clergy who have used the power of God to manipulate and dominate others, especially those in our care. The other extreme is when we abdicate our power from God. We fail to live into the authority given to us to do the things that have been assigned to us. And as with all things God gives us, we're merely stewards. In the life of the deacon, one of the things that I have observed is that too often, and this I think also falls into the fault of the diocese too, not necessarily this particular one, but of diocese in general, is that deacons end up with an inferiority complex. Really, and legitimately. Because the church doesn't always know what the heck to do with them. And there's some weird manifestations of this, and I'm not trying to critique anybody, but just these are my observations. When you have deacons who say, well, you know, I'm just a deacon. So I'm just a priest. Just because we do different things doesn't mean that we're doing unequal things. Just because I'm the one who fills out the paperwork and he's the one who gets to go out and make trouble, see that I'm jealous, by the way, doesn't mean anything. The other thing is, is to differentiate deacons too much. There are dioceses that don't allow deacons to wear clerical collars. It baffles me. Because if somebody walks up to you and says, Hello, Father, you correct them. Actually, it's deacon. It's reverend. What do you need? Can we not do that? That's one of the reasons why, if you look at a great deal of the work that's done in the discernment process, we ask deacons to come in and share what their experiences are in the fullness of ministry. Because if not, they get left behind. 
So as you contemplate what it means to receive power from God, ask yourself this question, and this would be our question for discussion. Am I plugged in? Am I connected to God through prayer, the reading of scripture, through the people whom I serve? Or do I wander around on low battery, wondering why I feel as useless as a broken pot? I told you before that uh, when I was feeling that sense of burnout even before COVID, it, part of it manifested itself as shortness of breath, which is very scary. Okay, because the only time I'd ever truly felt something like that was when I had walking pneumonia. And I couldn't walk from here to there without sitting down. I mean, it was just burnt. How often are we asking people to serve in the church who are out of breath? Right? What do we need to do to help people understand, let me catch my breath for a minute? So I actually kind of want to look at two questions for our discussion. The one is the am I connected? And the next one would be what's my experience and understanding of the power that I'm going 